How many hot dogs do you eat in a day, Tim? I'd rather not answer that. Thank you, though. Did you eat hot dogs today? Not exactly. And why are you bringing this up? Well, you have mustard on your shirt, and frankly, your burps reek of hot dogs. I had a hot dog bowl earlier today. Yes, I did. And what is a hot dog bowl? It's like a burrito bowl, but it's chopped up hot dogs in a big old bread bowl. So like a much larger, less healthy hot dog? Can I go? I'm starving. Guess what day it is? Guess what day it is? It's Friday. Friday. Got to get down on Friday. Everybody's looking forward to the weekend. I have no idea why I have Fred Schneider's solo album. <laughs> <laughs> why did I buy this funky little purchase? Is, it, is, that, your, is that your Fred Schneider? Yeah. Why did I buy this funky little purchase? We have our own friends. We're the number one show in hospitals and on sinking riverboat casinos. Just to make sure I've gotten all the information correct, I'm going to need Hello? you to confirm a few more things. I need some help, please. Your name is Eric Targis. Is this correct? OK, I'll go ahead and make that change. Great, I've made the change. Your wife's new legal name is Targis, Targis. Let's get to the jokes. All right, hello, good morning, and welcome everyone to a Friday edition of TBTL, the show that just might be too beautiful to live. I like turtles. My name is Luke Burbank. I am your host. You want showmanship? You got it. Coming to you once again from the Garment District of New York City. You really are the most devious bastard in New York City. Where it is absolutely gorgeous out. There are like... I'd say probably three and a half weeks. Uh, there's like a week and a half or maybe two weeks at, as, as spring is uh, getting towards summer and then as summer is getting towards fall. I believe they call those the shoulder seasons. There are a few weeks where you cannot beat the weather in New York City. And then there's the rest of the year where there is literally <laughs> nowhere in the world where they have worse weather than New York City. But we are in the good week, my friend. This is the good place. It's episode 4,218 in a collector's series. Let the fun begin. Boy, yesterday was quite a day here in New York City. Donald Trump found guilty on 34 charges of felony fraud. I decided to take a stroll up to... Um, Shame on everybody involved. Stroll up to Tump, uh, Trump Tower just to kind of see what the scene was. And it was um, it was an interesting scene, I'll tell you that. Now that's interesting. We also had what I think is called Manhattan Henge here, which is, speaking of rare occurrences in New York, a few times a year, the Earth's rotation around the sun. Wait, Earth face east. I'm trying to remember this. Somehow it is the case that it, Manhattan is turned into Stonehenge, basically, and the Sunset shines directly down the streets, and it's quite beautiful. Anyway, it was an eventful day here yesterday, and we're going to talk about it with this guy, the longest-running Cobro of the show, maybe best known for his depictions of the tall ships. Indeed, Queen. He's Andrew Walsh, and he's joining me right now. Good morning, my friend. Good morning, Luke. So you picked a good week to be in New York City. I'm sorry, New York City. Thank you. Please mm -hmm. say it. You really are the most devious bastard in New York City. Wow, I was nowhere close on that. But close enough that you knew what I was doing, so that's yes. important. Yeah. Me and the listeners. Mm -hmm, sure. Yeah, it's a uh, quite a quite a time to be here. Um, I uh, decided so. Yesterday, I uh, was actually in a meeting when the verdict came back, so I didn't, I didn't realize that the jury had um, had uh, had reached their verdict. I was kind of totally unaware, and and I got a text from Becca that was just like the screen cap of like the New York Times that was like guilty on all charges mm -hmm. or whatever, and it was it was quite shocking. Um, where were you when you found out? I was actually watching them roll in. I had just gotten off of a phone call myself, and I remember even thinking on the phone call, I guess, oh, I guess I'll find out after this call what the deal is, because I saw some people posting like, oh, my God, you know, the, the jury has reached some sort of conclusion, but, you know, we're waiting to find out what those conclusions are. I don't think conclusion is what they say in the court of law. Forgive me. Um, I'm verdict. Dead. Verdict is what they call it. conclusion. We have reached a conclusion. And we, we think have reached a suspicion. We have reached an inkling. 
and we believe that... Your Honor, we, the jury, have reached a hunch. <laughs> I've reached a hunch. Then I'm not good at this. Anyway, um, yeah, so I, I did sort of, I got off the phone, and I was like, oh, I guess I'll... Uh, so uh, across the top of the New York Times yesterday, they had like a... They had almost like a kind of a, not a ticker, but basically they had a little button for every single count. Count one through 34. And then there was a, going to be a little light underneath it or a little button that was going to say guilty or not guilty. But when I opened up the newspaper, they all said pending or, or you know, not not declared mm -hmm. yet or whatever. Um, not hunched yet is what I think it said. Uh -huh. And so yes. I was like, oh, I guess I'll just watch these light up. And then and then I was like, you know what? And I, I don't think I've ever told you this, but I, you know. I did a little Googling a while back. I found a little place where you can stream yourself some gray market MSNBC. <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, I went to this one website. Who's where... the person that, that both has good progressive morals? They, uh -huh. want, they, they want to watch M MSNBC, but they also are just shady enough to figure out. I don't mean <laughs> yeah. you, but I mean the no, source. I'm talking about the shady. source of it, not you. Not yeah, you. yeah. anyway, so I went to this one website that I sometimes go to when I want to stream MSNBC. Sometimes I just want it, like, like, not even, like, specifically to watch Chris's show or something. You know, like, Chris's show, when I used to have cable, and I know you do this, too, like, it starts at 5 o'clock our time, and you can sort of, like, plan around it a little bit. But every now and then, I just like to sit down at lunchtime, eat a bowl of soup, and just watch whatever, like, the stream is, sort of, and sort of half pay attention to it. That's something I miss from having access to cable all the time. So I found this website, and I, I, I utilized that. So I had the times up, and I was listening to, um, you know, the, I think they... I, I don't know if Chris was up there on the dais yet, but you had a lot of the MSNBC hosts kind of on the on at the desk, just sort of waiting mm -hmm. for the uh, for verdict to come out. And so that I was watching live when I can't remember the host's name. You would know his name, and he just kind of read one guilty, two guilty as they were coming out. It was kind of a it was I, I think it, for some folks will end up being a sort of iconic televised moment. Yeah, which I completely missed, even though, A, I had been past the courthouse in the morning, and I was 10 minutes away from the guy's lair, which yeah. really looks like a lair. I've never really given a lot of thought to Trump Tower, but as I was walking over to it yesterday afternoon, it's, you know, there's, it's uh, sort of on Fifth Avenue, and there are a lot of beautiful, like, historic buildings there. There's, I think it's... Um, what was St. Paul's Cathedral, I think. There's, of course, 30 Rock, where Chris works, and that's this gorgeous Art Deco building with this sort of Atlas um, shrugging. Is that what they mean when they say Atlas shrugged? I'm not even kidding. I can sort of picture the Atlas shrug specifically. Uh, was that a phrase before the book? Yeah, was that what the stat like what the what the image was called before Anne Rand's book? And I know it's Ein, but I can't get into that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know um, that statue, whatever of the Atlas. Anyway, mm -hmm. it's very, it's it's really beautiful. I mean, Manhattan, big parts of it are really architecturally interesting. And then you just have this kind of like, sort of just monstrous looming black glass thing that's. It's sort of not old enough to be a classic, but it's also not like cool, new, rem, cool house type architecture. It's just, it seems fitting that that's where the dude's layer is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, and so that I, is, I, I went, mean, this is a really dumb question, but I just want to be very clear because I know that he had like a press conference there. Um, I was actually a little bit confused. I heard him, actually, can you clear up a couple of things for me here? Yes. Um, um, almost Call me your Ari Melber. I'm a poor man's <laughs> Jen Saki. <laughs> Immediately after the inkling came out, um, <laughs> I heard Trump. Are they making another documentary about Robert Durst? <laughs> the inkling. The inkling. I know, but after the verdict came out, you know, like I said, I sort of have, by the way, I mean, we're missing kind of the elephant in the room here. The Mariners were also playing a day game at the exact same time, too. So I had Mariners on one TV and then, or on one computer screen, and then on the other computer screen, I had Gray Market MSNBC and the Gray Lady, <laughs> um, uh, which was <laughs> bought. And Gray Market Mariners. Boy, you're and just. Gray Market Mar but I paid for the New York Times. That no, okay. nothing gray market about the gray lady. So anyway, um, so I'm sort of like, and I'm writing the newsletter, so I'm just sort of like kind of multitasking here. Um, and then so I saw Trump's like you know deranged sort of reaction to it. Um, and then I, and, but I thought that that was just like kind of a quick like three or four minute impromptu 
press rambling. And then I read in the paper today that he gave like a real like a 33 minute press conference or something at Trump Tower. Am I right about the order of things that he gave a short yes. reaction yesterday and then a longer one today, but covered some yes. of the same broad themes? Yes. Well, you've got to admire his consistency. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what, I mean, did he bring up I mean, the idea message... that a bunch of people are, are breaking out of um, in, insane asylums and, and crossing into the country, which was one of his he points is, yesterday? He's nothing if not message consistent. Mm -hmm. his, 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 his commitment to <laughs> being completely <laughs> off the rails at all times is quite something to see. Yeah, so he came out of court. And uh, just stood in front of the reporters and, and launched into one of his normal sort of tirades and then went back to Trump Tower. And so by the time I turned the TV on, again, I can't overstate this. There was something weirdly cinematic about the fact that this was all happening and the guy was just in like a penthouse apartment five minutes away from mm -hmm. me. An all black glass giant building, mm -hmm. his lair called Trump Tower, mm -hmm. where he may come down or may not. Like it, it felt like some Batman shit. Mm -hmm. I know we were just talking about Batman yesterday on the show, but like. So or Lex I, Luthor, honestly, I get more Lex Luthor, but not vibes. the funny Gene Hackman kind. No, but also there is probably a helicopter pad on the top of that thing. Right. And oh, Power. presumably. Yeah, oh, that was so. another thing yesterday. Speaking of helicopters, we were I was doing this interview at the ACLU and we were in this The ACLU offices are actually really nice. And I don't know what I thought they were going to be. I guess I thought they were going to be working out of the back of like a bakery. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have like, like an old are going to have like yeah. de doors for desks and yeah, or like I the think vibe of, of public radio when you and I were working there in like the yes. late 90s and early 2000s. So it's going to be like, like when I worked at w flat roofed building. Or like when I worked at WNYC here in New York and we were in one center street, which is actually right near where the courthouse is. And it was the building where you also went to get married. And so we would be, you have to go through security. This is post 9-11. So you have to wait in line with people that were going up to get married. And the mm. actual facilities of WNYC were so so run down just it was it was like the most un uh, untended to city building mm. i mean it had an insane view it was at the tip of, of southern manhattan and it looked out over everything i mean the location was incredible but the actual like the chairs we were using the desks the like hallways it all was very institutional and it had not been maintained at all mm -hmm. and the only thing and in, i've mentioned this before but there was one bathroom and it was just in the back of the newsroom and many famous people, my desk was near this, and many famous people had to go into the bathroom and drop a deuce right near me, mm -hmm. which was bad feng shui. And also, there could be somebody waiting for them outside the yes. door as they come out. Yeah, I used to work in a Looking place at you, Claire like Danes. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, so um, the only thing that WNYC had going for it on any level was free seltzer water. And I didn't even drink seltzer water at the time it was a foreign concept to me but everybody was like i'd be like oh man it's a thousand degrees in here today or oh my gosh it's negative a thousand degrees and they go but we've got free seltzer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then eventually i came around on that but um but aclu but anyway, not like that aclu aclu in like a beautiful modern office building and in the office that we were doing the interview in um, it was this glass corner box looking out on the Statue of Liberty, which actually seemed very fitting. In fact, maybe too fitting. Hmm. A little on the nose, American <laughs> Civil Liberties Union, to look out upon the Statue of oh, Liberty. Come on, get over yourself. And so uh, the thing that we did not realize until they had set up a very elaborate camera system was that's also where there are, and I'm not exaggerating, Andrew, easily three to four helicopters taking off at any moment. Mm. I mean, the number of helicopter tours, that, that is, that's what you need to buy stock in. Manhattan helicopter tours. It never stopped. It wasn't like, oh, the helicopters took off, they're going to fly around Manhattan and then land, and then a new group of people is going to get on. There was no, it was like three helicopters would take off, and somehow there'd be three new helicopters, mm -hmm. and then they'd take off, and then there'd be three new helicopters. Mm -hmm. It was so loud. And then a guy started jackhammering somewhere in southern Manhattan, in a way that it went all the way up to the like mm -hmm. 18th floor of this building. And I would have to ask my questions in between jackhammering events. And I, I've just, I, there was Did no way to find somebody yell, the guy. hey, I'm walking here. And then somebody, <laughs> you could hear somebody else say, grab a slice. That was my I opinion. feel like I needed to enter a Mentos dimension. <laughs> do, 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 where I pop a Mentos in my <laughs> mouth. And I somehow pretend to be a construction worker and I pogo stick off on his jackhammer and he doesn't have it anymore. 
But um, but yeah, so that was a whole thing that we had not planned for. It was actually way harder to do that interview in that in that room than we uh, expected. But anyway, so I, it was weird for me to be so close to all of this today or yesterday rather, but then to also been completely in the dark when it happened. So I flip the TV on. I go to MSNBC. I'm watching. I'm watching here. <laughs> I'm watching all the stuff go on. And uh, at some point, so Trump is now back at Trump Tower and I see him come out and like do. By the way, if there's anyone on the planet who doesn't get to do the black power fist, it's Donald Trump. Yeah. Like you and I don't get to do it, but he especially mm-hmm. doesn't get to yeah, do it. Right. Like, he is he is at the very top of the mm-hmm. list of you can't do that, mm-hmm. <laughs> dude. Mm-hmm. And it's his favorite thing. And it's just so <laughs> grotesque. Mm-hmm. To Absolutely. Watch. Yep. So he and the, so he comes out. And he's got like, I'm watching this on TV. He's got Secret Service with him. By the way, I don't want to get into, I don't want to, how do I say this without sounding like I'm judging people? We don't, we, we're, we're pretty careful on the show about how we talk about bodies. They did not appear to give Donald Trump the pick of the Secret Service litter. He had some pre, he had some Secret Service guys that looked like if they had to jog a block, it's over. Mm-hmm. I always thought Secret Service. You know, members were just the most, they were, they were just the, the absolute elite and were, you know, some sort of Matt Damon character, you know what I mean? Where they've gotten, they have know all, every form, like they can kill a man with, you know, five different ways or something. Like they're, without touching they're just, him, just with their exactly, looks, with like, their eyes, with their, with their handsomeness mm-hmm. and their seriousness. And <laughs> like, that's how, I, particularly if you're the Secret Service that's assigned to a, a guard a former president. It was a motley crew of dudes. They could be They're decoys. St- they could be like the decoys, so that you think that the you think that security is soft, but then you have like uh-huh. a, you know a lot of hidden um, agents around who are going to. They're literally repelling from those tiny little cables. There's just above. something that looks like a tree, but it just turns into <laughs> a very very buff dude. Does that does that mailbox like, have eyes? Right. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm going over trying to. Uh, karate chop the uh, Atlanta bomber Richard Jewell <laughs> one of the guys looked exactly like Richard Jewell oh. but anyway um, that was a weird reference because what, we we're talking about terroristic events yeah, it, was, cetera, yeah, it, was but it was a strange mm-hmm. the guy just literally looked like Richard Jewell I'm sorry I can only report the facts so I'm, I'm watching it on TV and Trump comes out and he's got Eric Trump behind him and Eric Trump is like got his cell phone up and he's just making a video like any other tourist in New York and he's shooting it over his dad's shoulder and Trump is like waving and he's doing the black power fist and he's just kind of like mugging out there and being like, thank you so much, all my supporters. And I thought, oh, right, this guy is like five minutes away from here. I should go see what this what this looks like. And so I start walking over there. And and first of all, w- one of the things I see I posted on Instagram is somebody has already written good job, D.A. Bragg. <laughs> somebody has graffitied good job, mm-hmm. D.A. Bragg, <laughs> which that was quick. That extra, extra, mm-hmm. read all about it. Fresh graffiti. <laughs> like, Reflex zeitgeist. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, um, I'm a little distracted here because I, I do this all the time, too. And I'm just I need to clear that I need to clear something up here. Did we just once again accuse Richard Jewell of the bombing? Or did we say suspect? Yes, bomber? and I'm sorry. He was. We got it. I called we, him. We, the, yeah, I do that. I'm sorry. I know. He was the opposite of that. <laughs> I just wanted I'm, to get that out there thank you, because thank poor you. son of a gun. No, I'm sorry. I I should have said wrongly accused bomber <laughs> Richard Jewell. I really should have. You're exactly right. But Andrew, I could care less about your corrections. No, thank you for thank you for doing that. That's a that's a very important point actually. Um, but anyway, uh, so it was just a, it was just the energy was popping off in Manhattan and I walk over there and again, I'm seeing very zeitgeisty graffiti and I get over to Trump tower. I mean, well really the area across from Trump tower. And I am struck by the fact that there are like 80 people there tops. It was very sparsely attended mm-hmm. considering what had just gone down. I thought it was going to be like, you know, you could like from three blocks away, there was just going to be a scrum of humanity. Mm-hmm. And you're that was not the mostly case. like sort of anti-Trump protesters. This is like this. I'm, I'm imagining people jeering against mm-hmm. Trump, but then also a bunch of people in MAGA gear and like mm-hmm. the police are there and 
Gary Oldham is Chief Gordon is trying to hold <laughs> back the somebody has released all the inmates of Arkham Asylum. It's right. like oh, I, I forgot that I forgot that you watched Bane recently. I know I got a lot of Batman on the brain right now. I'm sorry. We I I don't want to distract you. We should talk about what we're talking about now. But later on in the show, it occurred to me that you told me you watched the Bane movie Dark Knight Rises recently. I never asked you what you thought of it, and I I was kicking myself after yesterday's show because I actually am very interested in your opinion on that movie not right now but maybe later in the show if possible so i was really struck i mean there were certainly people there but it was not like there was what it was mostly was new yorkers trying to get home yeah from work yeah and then the media you know probably five or six news cameras kind of set up but like very limited police presence no police presence on the side of the street which was the other side of the street from trump tower where the media was kind of set up But like, I don't know, a handful of cameras, also a lot of people that had selfie sticks that were doing, you know, citizen journalists or something. And they were just there right next to like whatever WABC or whomever. Like it was a surprisingly unregulated scene. There were not very many people. There were fewer people than I expected. It was just a lot of people doing what I did, which was like stopping to take a selfie or to take a picture of Trump Tower and then moving on. And then there were a total of four MAGA people. Hmm. These, they were very, very elderly. They were, did not appear to be super agers, by the way. I've been on a hot streak with that. These, they seem to be aging at exactly, they seem to be as cognizant as their 80 years would predict. Uh-huh. And they, one of them couldn't, she could not get her flag together. Like she was having a problem with her flag. She was trying to figure out how to hang it on this, you know, broom well, stick people, or whatever. If there's one thing I've learned... <laughs> In the news coverage for the past two weeks, is that these people love flags. They need to get their flag game down. Flags are they're fond of flags, if I understand. The it woman correctly. was doing almost no protesting, and she was f- fully she was laser focused on trying to fix her flag <laughs> situation because it was it was a problem. It was, she was flying it upside down. Her name was Jan Alito. Yeah. No. I was, um, do you think that that is what like a MAGA's stress dream is? Like, oh, I got this. <laughs> I'm at the protest. I got this flag, but I I can't quite get it all together, and it's getting tangled up in other things. I just I just want to protest. It's never like there's a problem with the protest. It's a tiny little detail that won't uh-huh. allow you to protest. Yeah, like exactly. When I have my stress dream about stand-up comedy, I can't find a pencil to write my jokes down with. Exactly. Or the, my my ultimate stress dream, which goes back years and years now, but I always think of it as I was at some water park somewhere, and there was just a crush of people walking in the opposite direction that I'm walking, but I'm carrying a big inflatable raft, and I'm trying to fight through the crowd with a big inflatable raft. And somehow it was just like was the epitome of like – impotence in trying to like get through the crowd with this with this object if somebody would have given you a mentos it could have really changed <laughs> yeah, well, the whole scene yeah, yeah, you're just you. crowd surfing <laughs> with with my misguided use of the word impotence there i'm glad you went with mentos <laughs> so um so what i was struck by was that it actually i mean again there were people there but there were not it wasn't i don't know what i expected it to be some sort of borderline riot with with both factions showing up and and the police there trying to keep it peaceful or whatever. And and that was not really the scene. There were some people, but it was just mostly looky-loos and mostly also just people literally on the sidewalk trying to get home. And then for, they did not appeal, appear to be fully having their faculties, the people that were in like full head-to-toe MAGA gear. I just heard one woman yelling, well, Joe Biden is the crooked one. And I thought, well, you've cracked the case. Yeah. <laughs> you've Because this is also what happens with these things. There was four MAGA protesters, and then there was like four citizen journalists interviewing them. Mm-hmm. You know, there's usually the number of journalists seem to be, uh, there seem to be more journalists or more people doing yep. what, you know, they're considered to be journalism than there are the people there to support Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. But I guess this is my whole takeaway from this. What's crazy to me is when he was doing all that black power fist, he was just doing it to nobody. And what the hell was Eric Trump even videotaping? Mm. Like, it was a very, like, if this was a TBTL event, I would have felt bad about the turnout. <laughs> and we've had some, I mean, we had a bowling party that two people uh-huh. came to. We, we, had a, um, we had a first night party that nobody came to. Jason Andrews had the decency to not break out a cake that he had made. Oh, I didn't because know about it that story. Oh, yeah. The first night of TBTL. We announced on air that we were going to a bar that Jen loved kind of near her house called Bandits. Hmm. And somehow we had been really throwing around this, I think because of the 
the TBTL thing we were talking, we were describing like a firefly that you put in a jar and it's dead the next day. Or somehow there was a butterfly metaphor that was, I guess, Jason had made a cake. Jen's husband, Jason, had made a cake that had a butterfly on it. Oh, okay. It was a beautiful cake. He's very artistic. And he brought the cake and then he just, we, went, we announced on the air, we're going to Bandit's after party. See you there. And it was me and Jen and probably Sean and Jason. Mm-hmm. That was and your, after your very the, first show? That was after our very first show, like mm-hmm. a Monday show. We said, we're going to Bandit's after party. We'll meet you there. Nobody came. Mm-hmm. And it was so, I mean, we didn't, I guess we didn't care that much, but Jason thought, let's not break out the cake for this. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. I'm getting intrusive thoughts about a cringy thing. I, I think I did, I tried to do something similar after the first week. I think the first Friday uh, after a, a week of doing the night show when I had, and I was probably just like trying to ape your game. And I, I mean, a few folks showed up. I think we went to Shorty's, the old Shorty's in Belltown, which is uh-huh. exactly like the new Shorty's in Belltown. It was, it was a fine time. I'm just cringing at whatever I thought I was doing at the time. What the hell did I think I was doing at the time? Oh, Who stop it. You've I got it. I mean, what are you going to do? Not try? Like, you yeah. Know? Like, you, what yeah. you were doing was you were hosting a radio <laughs> show and you were building. <laughs> the answer is yes. It's the answer like, is stop. Yeah, 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 exactly. From that moment forward, I learned an important lesson that. No, that's insulting to the people who came out because at this point, I'd already been on TBTL for some time. So some folks from TBTL mm-hmm. came out. It just sort of seemed like a weird thing, a weird imitative thing for me to do um, as I'm as as you're recounting that story. And I'm over here literally. We don't even have cameras on today and I'm blushing remembering some. Oh. Oh. I know. Maybe I'm just having. But by a day. Friday we had by Friday we had abs- we had a total of two people I think uh-huh. show up at Sunset Lanes. I like that so, you, you went know, right back at it. You waited four days and went right back I don't, to Sunset that's Lanes. That's kind of crazy to me. And I feel like we we felt pretty good about two people showing up. <laughs> that's the funny no, part. that's how, that's how it works. You set those expectations low. All the listeners who didn't show up on Monday were doing you a favor. So that was like. My thought as I got to this thing was, this is fewer people than I expected. And what was Trump doing? He was he came out because I could see right where he had been. And he was just like, you know, fist black powering and like waving and being kind of like, I love you. And then when I got there, I looked around. I was like, he was talking, certainly wasn't talking to any fans. Mm -hmm. Because, by the way, where the MAGA people were, maybe they had moved around. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the MAGA people were even over near where he had come out in the behind these barriers. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Because this whole time, I'm like, well, it sounded, I, I thought you said there were like, did you say 80 before? There might have been 80 people there, but it didn't seem like that much can, can, given the context. I was like, well, I guess he was given, you know, he was kind of given that symbol to, or putting the fist in the air to that crowd. But you're saying that wouldn't have even geographically made sense. I'm saying the crowd was mostly reporters mm-hmm. and then uh, some people taking selfies. No MAGA people. Like, the MAGA people were further down mm-hmm. the street. Mm-hmm. So he was, at best, he was saluting uninterested tourists slash people who don't like him mm-hmm. and the media. What he didn't have there was a like a, a, a large group of supporters who he was reaching out to. And I don't know why that bit of, like, kayfabe or, you know, mm-hmm. fakery... Really, like, of course, this guy's going to do stuff that's fakey. Like, that's his whole thing. But some, it was, it was very weird to watch him on TV and watch him come out. And they, of course, they're not shooting. The camera's not shooting over his shoulder. You're just seeing him. And then to get there and to be like, this is what he was saluting? Like the time um, that I saw the photo of the back of the Wheel of Fortune wheel. Not the Wheel of Fortune wheel, the yes. Price is Right wheel. And like yes. just seeing that it was like cardboard with some like magic marker markings on the back of it was like kind of a... And and yet I'm also not a fan of this guy's. Whereas I would die for the prices right here. Oh, absolutely, yes. Andrew Carey. Yeah, I would vote for Bob Barker a third time if I could. Yeah. So like that's the other weird thing is like I don't know what, how I'm let down by this guy who I f- yeah. think is a real danger to democracy and a, pr- a, a a proven liar. I don't know why this little bit of theatrics kind of got me. Mm-hmm. But I just when I got there, I was like. And who was Eric Trump filming? Mm-hmm. Like what? Like what? I because when I watch it on TV, I thought, oh man, they must, you know, they, the Staten Island Ferry must have delivered a bunch of MAGA people, and they're all out there stopping the steal, and he's mm-hmm. he's playing to his base. He had no base there. Mm-hmm. Release he was like the Eric my, Trump cut is what we need. It was like he was like the Honda Civic, the 1980 Honda Civic that I drove that had like one working speaker. He had no base, mm-hmm. <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> he was he, he was no base. He, it was the opposite of Megan Trainer. Exactly. Yes. So, um, and then as I was walking home from that, walking back towards the hotel, I um, w- was caught, not caught, but 
I noticed everybody was standing in the middle of the street with their phones out because this is how we, that's how you know something's happening, Andrew. If a bunch of people mm. have their phones out, now it's time to pay attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Real life is occurring. It's being documented. And all these people were hoisting their phones up because it was this Manhattan hinge thing where the sun somehow lines up perfectly where it moves up the streets. So not the, not the big number blocks, like not 4th Avenue, 5th Avenue, 6th Avenue, but the like 42nd Street, 43rd Street, 44th mm. Street, 44th Street rather. And it was the crazy, I just like walked home and every street I would look down, you just, the sun was moving like with me. It oh, interesting. I saw your photo of that, but I didn't realize that that is like kind of a special occurrence. I just thought it was a cool sunsetty photo. I didn't realize what was going on. I think on. it happens like four times a year or something. Interesting. Oh. Yeah. So it was a... It was quite the day to be here in uh, in New York City, and uh, I don't think it will. I don't think it will have any impact on the election. I mean, that was the thing going into it. There was, you know, I think NPR actually did a poll. I know we're not here to talk politics, and <laughs> there's lots of places people can get this, but it was like 15 percent of the people they polled said they were they're not going to vote for Trump if he's convicted, and then like I think it was 17 percent said, "Well, I won't vote for him if he's a convicted felon," and 15 percent said, "I'll only vote for him if he's a convicted felon." <laughs> I'm more likely to vote for him if he's a convicted oh, felon. Yeah, so... Yeah. I mean, what a world. Yeah, exactly. That's why, you know, I took this news yesterday. Um, I, I was shocked. I, I didn't expect him to be uh, found guilty, certainly not on all, all 34 counts. Um, and so I was surprised by it. But for me, I just, you know, I saw a lot of celebrating online, and I, and I get that. You know, one thing I saw that... It, it's weird that I, that I would bring this up because it's such a minority of what I saw mostly what I saw was a lot of people like kind of reposting either the the New York Times headline you know Trump found guilty or whatever or some you know kind of clever like needling or onion I guess the needling is sort of a local reference but you know some parody headlines or whatever some joking around and that's all fine I saw a lot of people posting the um upcoming New Yorker cover that they released right away where I'm sure you've seen that all over the place too it's I can't remember the artist's name but it's I actually a, haven't is it Barry Blit, maybe it's sort of the kind of sketchy um, kind of illustration uh, that's almost kind of like shaky lines, and it's a photo or it's an image of of Trump putting his hands into um, handcuffs, but his hands are tiny. Um, it was people they they released it early, and that'll be I guess the next magazine cover. And I saw a lot of people um, sharing that. The one thing that I saw, and again, I don't even know why I'm focusing on this, but. It kind of reminded me of another contingent. Like a lot of the people that I follow on social media, um, you know, have very strong opinions about these types of things coming from the left. Um, but there's also like they're not there's a sort of um, how can I put this a more basic aspect of social media that maybe I don't follow as much. And uh, there's a former colleague of mine who I uh, who I adore, by the way, but his online presence is just kind of so much more basic than mine. And he was like posting these memes of like, um, you know, like Biden and Hillary and Obama all laughing. And I'm just kind of like, that's like not the that's exactly what you don't want to kind of put yeah. out there. I'm just like, yeah, I'm, exactly. I, I'm glad you kind of agree with me on that. Cause I always have like kind of, you, you would look at yesterday's news as being something, you know, kind of to celebrate as far as the criminal justice system is concerned. People feel like justice was served. I get that, but I'm, you know, I'm just still, I'm clenched until November. You know what I mean? Like the, the proof is in the pudding for me. As long as this guy does not make it an office, then I will breathe a sigh of relief up until then. Like you're citing that poll. I can't tell what this means. <laughs> the fifty yeah. percent of people I'll only vote for him if he's found guilty. I mean, people are crazy. Um, but then when I see these sort of like kind of more basic memes, I'm like, oh yeah, this is kind of like the the left's equivalent of you know the 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 proverbial uncle on Facebook sharing memes on the right yeah. or whatever. They were just janky and stupid, and also play into this idea that the right has, and I don't even mean the far right MAGA people, but maybe even just like the kind of general Republicans who are trying to make peace with the fact that they're. Their party is what it is today. Seeing like, yeah, see, this all was just like this. All, all those Crooked Biden Hillary. lovers and yeah, why are you even putting Hillary in these memes? Like, honestly, like no, yeah. no disrespect to, to her as as a person or a politician, but like, what are you doing? You think that you think yeah. that helps anything? Yeah, don't play into that idea at yeah. all. That it's yeah. some kind of a, a conspiracy. I mean, I'm not saying anything that probably uh, that certainly that that our listeners aren't aware of, uh, but. 
the 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 irony of how overt Trump has been about the fact that he wants to and the ways that he has like factually and provably tried to use whatever levers of power he has to take out personal vendettas on mm-hmm. people. The fact that he is claiming that's what Biden is doing when there's zero evidence. And in fact, I'm looking at a headline in The New York Times. It's basically now I don't have it on my phone anymore, but it was basically saying, like, after Trump conviction, Biden stays on sidelines. And this is like a picture of him at, like, you know, Arlington National Cemetery or something like doing something very untrump related because he has stayed a thousand miles away from this. And he also doesn't Alvin Bragg does not report to him. And by the way, I thought Alvin Bragg's. Uh, press conference was pretty interesting yesterday. That's another thing. I was listening to WNYC on my uh, headphones as I'm strolling through Manhattan, listening to Alvin Bragg do this uh, press conference, which, again, he very wisely was just like very appreciative of the jury. Uh, He referred to Trump as the defendant, Mm -hmm. and he just didn't go in for any gloating. He didn't go in for any kind of theatrics. He Mm -hmm. just was very, very, very by the book, which you have to be with these guys because they're trying to say that this is all some big conspiracy and it's not. So, yeah, those memes are not helping. I thought that I, and I'm I'm Googling it here and I can't find it on the fly. But, you know, like you have various reactions to this that would be officially sort of coming from the Biden camp, which is like the, you know, the the campaign aspect of it. They had a, a press release, which was, you know, more restrained than clearly <laughs> anything that's ever come out of uh, Trump's camp has been. Um, And then, you know, and and I think Biden had some statements about like reacting less to the verdict, but by the by the crap that Trump has been saying since then and calling it dangerous and reckless, which it absolutely is. But the the official like governmental press house release, I believe. And again, I can't find this on on the fly here, but I believe it was just like one or two sentences that like was very like kind of just restrained that, you know, something about due process or something. I was just like, man, what a huge difference than if the shoe was on the other foot and Trump was in the White House. Can you imagine the crazy that would have been scrawled all over the official White House press release? Oh, my gosh. I can't even like Blakely McInerney, his press, some press secretary he hired eight minutes ago. Yeah. He just graduated right. from LSU. Right, right. It would make Kofefi seem like a thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, that's not helping, okay? This is a very serious matter, okay? It is a serious Don't give them matter. what they want. Yeah. We was hoping for some razzle-dazzle. Razzle-dazzle. That's right, man. Razzle-dazzle. On your mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. Go. Everybody ready. Hey, it's about that time. Time for us to thank some dazzling donors. These are the incredible, generous, wonderful folks who are dazzling us with their donation of dough. It's keeping TBTL going. And look who it is. It's our friend, Lisa Moylanin Potts, pronounced Nicole Kidman. (laughs) All right, Lisa. Somehow, heartbreak feels good in a place like this. (laughs) Somehow, forgetting celebrities' names feels right in a place like this. (laughs) Uh, Lisa is in Olympia, Washington, and says, Thanks, Luke, Andrew, and now John, for everything you do to make me laugh, question my own understanding of news and factual information, and always <laughs> have an anecdote. Wait, what is I that? What Hold that on. I, what, so what we do is we make Lisa question her own understanding of news and factual information. Is that because we're so wrong that it makes Lisa question reality? Or we're helping uh, create a more informed public? I'm going to assume it's door number two with no with absolutely no reason to okay. assume that we're creating a more informed public. I'm going to I'm going to go with that. OK, well, I'll take it. Um, uh, and always you always have an anecdote to share, even when people don't want to hear it. Oh. When I try to explain TBTL when I'm on a business trip, I say I could tell them where I am and I bet someone would show up to hang out. Oh. This is definitely not a weird cultish thing, cultish <laughs> thing to say. I so I think it. that's a reference to the tens. right? Yeah, I love that. The tens have been putting in some work. I got a, a listener, Chad, I think, slid into my DMs mm. with a picture of the foot of Ladybug Cross. Does that name ring a bell, Andrew? Ladybug Cross? Yes. Your, your, your new Facebook friend, your bestie. Yes. My, this, I think, AI-generated person who reached out to me, or in, in as much as I bot can reach out, to try to buy this couch or these chairs for me, whichever one it was. And I totally thought it was a real person. And I guess that over on the tens page, 
I think maybe Chad posted these photos, found the Ladybug, Ladybug Cross account mm-hmm. and posted it over there. And then I get this one photo where it's her and her husband are sitting in like a hallway, like an upstairs hallway of just kind of like imagine like a typical split level house. But they're sitting on the ground. Yeah, in the I, I can picture you told me and they're almost like eat, their backs are to a wall and they're facing each other and they're sitting crisscross applesauce. Yes. And I think kissing. Oh. And it's the weirdest. It's just the last place you would do that. But it's also like a very posed uh-huh. photo. Uh-huh. And it's to me, it has to be the result of AI gone gone wrong. Like it, it's got it mostly right. It's like, oh, people on their Facebook pages, human people have pictures of them and their loved one and their partner, you know, in a romantic uh, embrace. But like and then sometimes it's in the home. Like it's like using the the large language model that it's got of information, but then it just doesn't understand that we don't sit crisscross applesauce on the floor of the hallway mm-hmm. and do that. Mm-hmm. And now and is so, there something about her foot that plays into this? Her foot is really weird. Uh-huh. Her foot is like all, cru- it's bare and it's all crushed up like under her body in this kind of un- unnatural way. So anyway, that was um, Chad helping me out. Point being that the tens are always there for, they're there for each other, they're there for me. Um, they're a good bunch of people. They're mm-hmm. there for listener Lisa. Uh, Lisa says, a special shout out to my TBTL baby, Eric, for sharing your incorrect takes and to the one and only Deb for letting me sidekick to TBTL events. I, we need to revisit something earlier in this. I, I think that clearly with the um, with the, the 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 furthering the further comments coming from Lisa, I think we are not creating a more informed public. I'm uh, seeing a lot of references really? to us being um, maybe not Loud right, wrong. not right all the time. Slightly, slightly different than right is how I like to put it. To commemorate this year, here are some musical moments I think about and sing about often. I'm hoping by writing them down, they get out of my brain. The McGruff Crime Dog song episode with extended Eleanor Rigby Gabagool song mashups. Wow. Is that a thing we did? I remember getting into some McGruff stuff. Here, what is... (laughs) um, Was this Sounds like you're dealing with some McGruff stuff. Now this is we can't Mark play up here. I want you to learn a song that tells people to say no to drugs. Users are losers and losers are <laughs> users. So don't use drugs. Don't use drugs. We did go on some sort of McGruff um, rabbit hole. What I have here on my hard drive for some reason is a, a full half hour of McGruff's Smart Kids album, a cassette. Yeah, rip. I remember we played a bunch of that, and the songs are pretty great. Yes. <laughs> kind of a little jazzy at times uh-huh. when you drop kick your habit as yeah. you walk through the door. Yeah, strong. Uh, um, What's his name? Oh, food. oh God. Uh, Leon Redbone. Leon vibrations. Redbone. Yes, I told you, uh, and I, I won't go on the whole thing again. But one of the, I, I believe, the only celebrity that I interviewed in his hotel room. Do you remember that? Wait, remind me. Way back when I worked for WKSU, I was still in college, um, but I was getting more and more involved in the um, public radio station there, and my responsibilities expanded to the point where I was working for the folk show, and for some reason, Leon Redbone fit in, into the, the let's say, um, wide tent of what we considered folk music. And so he was in town for something, and Jim Bloom, the host of the folk show, somehow deployed me a very nervous, like, like, I don't know, 19, 20, 21 year old me to go to some hotel room in Cleveland and interview Leon Redbone. Jim had given me a bunch of questions to ask. I believe that I had them on a piece of paper, which probably literally shook in my hand as I um, as I held a uh, microphone in the face of Leon Redbone and thought, huh, I know you from Mr. Belvedere. I bet you that when you interviewed Leon Redbone, he was younger than we are now. <laughs> oh, shit. Shoot, I want to do the math on that. I mean, it's very possible. I mean, he's a guy who seems like he was born about 85 yeah. years old. Yeah. But I bet you anything. I mean, maybe he was I in don't, his 50s. I, yeah. I bet you he was shockingly young. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I'm going to do the math on this. But yeah, that is going to blow my mind. <laughs> Other things that uh, live in Lisa's head that have a musical component from us. The original discovery of the Sea Yucks song. Oh, okay. Yeah. K-Dude and Little Hoagie, mm-hmm. of course. 
And then when Cher sang Wu Tang Baby, they rocked the world, and Luke oh. played it so many times, Andrew got annoyed. Sorry, Andrew. Mm-hmm. And of course, we can't play that because you deleted that. You promised yes, and me and you know that you I deleted it because you heard mm-hmm. the sound of the paper crumpling up. Yeah, way back I in 2015. The garage, the garage. Yet, yes. yet I feel like I've heard it played on the show since then because I, I, I feel like we have a trust issue. I, I think what it was was I deleted it from one computer but not uh, another mm-hmm. computer. And uh, let's see. Oh, guess what, Andrew? Dreams come true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so this was not the computer it. it was deleted from. I guess not. Um, so I'm putting Leon, Re- like, let's say that I interviewed him around the year 2000. Somebody should write a jingle about that. I'm going to say it was around the year 2000, and he was born in 1949, so he was younger than I would have guessed. He would have been about But 51. that would have still been, like, pushing 70. Uh, wait, am I doing my math wrong? Uh, if he was oh, born not... basically in 1950 and I interviewed him in 2000, oh, right. that'd be about 50. And he was born in 49, yeah. so that'd be like 51 years old, which is that He's is like three years is older still, than we are now. Shocking! That really is shocking. Because yeah, I would have told you that he was like. It, I don't even. I don't remember him actually smelling like cigars, but I would have told you that he was like 75 and reeking of cigars. Did he have like a? white suit on and like a straw hat i do a, believe he was wearing bushy, like gray mustache i do believe he had the mustache some sort of glasses and hat going on yeah i think that he was in i believe that is that is his look even when nobody's looking maestro oh shoot i was looking at wikipedia you can't spring that on, on your mark on your mark get set get set now ready ready go everybody ready I handled that pretty smoothly, though. Oh, yeah. Pretty professionally. We've got to thank Derek Schlichter of Kenmore, Washington. I think you put a T in there. Schlicker? Schlicker. I like the way Derek gave a pronunciation for his yeah, first name, but Derek. not his last name. <laughs> yeah, thanks, and then I went ahead thanks. and messed up his name. <laughs> thanks, Derek. Schlicker is quicker. That's how I always remember it. <laughs> thank you, Derek yes. Schlicker in Kenmore, Washington. In Kentmore, Washington. (laughs) Derek says, hey, dummies, another year, another victory for the OGs. Taking on that. What is it? Taking on the haters, the the sweats Mm -hmm. and the haters. I love that drop. I don't have it. That's yours. But that's one of my favorite. Let me see if I can find that just to remind ourselves. By the way, second Kenmore in a row, Dazzling Donor, because we had some Savage Moose talk yesterday during the Dazzling Donors with. um, Yeah, we did. Okay, here we go. Another day, another victory for the OG. Taking down the sweats, the imposters among us. (laughs) (laughs) When you just play the, the the top of that without playing the full uh-huh. thing, it, it, it kills a little part of me every time. Okay, there, all right, duly something, noted. <laughs> there's something about the the whole, just like the whole drop there that is amazing to me. The imposters among us, the Andrew. Imposters You're right. It's, I owe it to you and the listeners to play that in its, <laughs> in its fullness. It's like the shave and a haircut bit from Roger Rabbit. I need to hear the whole thing. Uh, Derek says, seriously, I can't believe we're past the 15 year mark of TBTL being in my life. Have we gotten our learner's permit yet? Because I think we can now. That's a good point. Special shout out to my tens in the wild, Connor from Vancouver, who I got into TBTL like a multi-level marketing (laughs) scam way (laughs) back when. And Mm -hmm. Nigel, the mayor of Kenmore, who I see almost daily at Kenmore's Diva Coffee Passing glances Ooh. awkwardly at each other with our headphones in. We both know what we're listening to. I love that nice. scene I love that. unfolding at Diva Coffee in Kenmore. Nice. Yeah, that's really cool. For my special request, since I can't seem to send along a song worthy of music for your weekend. Oh. Ooh, all right, Derek. Ooh. I get it. Ooh. Is to play Juliet Ivy's We're All Eating Other, a dreamy pop song about the futility of life and how we should just enjoy our experience while we're here it's haunting and beautiful and is a good reminder uh, not to be too serious. Hmm. We're all going to be dead soon. Okay, that oh. got dark, but yeah. I think mm-hmm. it's a good listen. Mm-hmm. Happy 2024, friendos. That's from Derek in Kenmore. All right. Well, I, have not, I haven't listened to this song yet, so I'm looking forward to the Music for Your Weekend segment later. We'll play it then. That's right. Derek, thank you very much for supporting the show. Yeah. We absolutely could not do this without you. Here I go once again with the email. Every week, I hope that it's from a female. Oh, man. It's not from a female. All right, before we get to music for your weekend, a rare Friday email and v segment, because you received a voice memo that you 
have not yet listened to, but you think we might as well just roll the dice on this one? Yeah, that there's one rule of TBTL Club, and that is you always talk about TBTL Club. But actually, mm-hmm. there's a second rule as well, which is you never play a voicemail. What is what does um, Al Pacino say in Glen Gary Glen Ross? You never, you never. You open always... your mouth until you know the shot. That's what it is. You never open your mouth. And so that's rule number two. And then rule number three is you never play a voicemail on TBTL without previewing it first. However, I have this came by way of voice memo into my email inbox, Andrew at TBTL.net, if you want to send us anything. Um, and I have not I have not listened to this. I listened to the very beginning of it. I know that the sound quality is good. I know that it's just over two minutes long. I know it has something to do with customer service. So you have my attention right there, uh, and I, I hope it's a I hope it's a good tale to spin. Stephen, take it away. I'm all ears. Hey, Luke and Andrew, I have a cringy customer service story that seems right up your alley. This was about 20 years ago. My kids were like three and six, and my wife was coming home from the East Coast. Um, her flight got delayed, or she had to change planes or something. And um, all I knew is that she wouldn't be until about 11 p.m. And um, of course her phone died at the airport so we couldn't really confirm. And um, I didn't know if she was gonna be on standby and if she was gonna make the flight. And you know, this was 20 years ago before chargers were everywhere so she couldn't just find a place to plug in and, and, and get back to me. So anyways, I pack up the kids, the stroller, car seat, everything, go to the airport uh, around 10 p.m. And I go to the ticket agent and um, ask the nice lady uh, if my wife made it onto the flight or not. And uh, she, punches into her terminal and she kind of looks at me and says, uh, due to regulation, sir, I can't tell you if someone's on the plane, uh, but uh, you know, you'll know, you just have to wait and see. And so I'm like, well, I've got my kids here. I, I you know, lost contact with my wife. I'd like to know if she made the flight or not. And she just kind of looks at me and says, I would just wait and see, sir. I, I, I can't tell you anything. Hmm. And so now I start getting kind of angry and you know, I've got my kids i'm like can't you just tell me if i should wait or or if you know if she's gonna be here or can i take my kids home and come back in the morning it's like sir i can't tell you i would just suggest that you go and wait <laughs> so i i grab wink, my wink. kids i stamp away angrily as i can you know pushing a stroller and having a six-year-old sleeping over my shoulder and you know i'm go over to the waiting area and I, as my head starts clear i realize the agent was telling me <laughs> My wife's on the plane. I should just go and wait for her. <laughs> so, yeah, of course, there she is, 11 o'clock. She gets off the plane. And um, as we start heading back to the parking lot, I'd say, hold on, I got to go apologize. And Aww. I go back to the agent, uh, the desk, and she's not there. And I feel terrible. <laughs> I asked the other lady who's there. I'm like, the agent who was working here, could you tell her? I'm very sorry. I'm an <laughs> idiot, and I didn't get what she was trying to tell me, and uh, I, I truly appreciate it. <laughs> I'll never forget that. That was the, probably one of the only times I stamped away from someone, and, uh, uh, yeah, that was my idiocy that uh, that caused that. But anyways, uh, power up. Have a good one, guys. Yeah, the repercussions, the emotional repercussions of stamping away, that is something that I am very familiar with. I get stampy at times, and I don't know exactly how it comes off. Maybe my... I mean, Genevieve, Genevieve can recognize my stampiness like an hour away. She knows when I'm going to get stampy, but I don't know how much the general public recognizes my stampiness in situations like that. Uh, I don't get st- stampy usually, but when I do, it's real bad. And I, you know, I've told this story many times, but probably the worst example of this was when I was trying to rent a car from the. I think it was the Enterprise rental lot on Roosevelt near where the oh, um, yeah. trading musician used to be. Yeah. Rest in power. Yes. And it was one of those things where it was like a Friday. It must have been a holiday Friday. And it was just the the place was overwhelmed. And I think I needed to go somewhere, I, maybe for vacation or work. But like I was counting on just walking in, getting this car and getting out of there. And I had taken a, an Uber. This is back when Uber Gen was mm-hmm. was uh, just absolutely papering the club with Uber rides for us. And uh, so the guy in the Uber, I said, just wait here. I'm going to run in and make sure it's all cool. And I get in and the waiting area is just packed with despondent people. And I realized that like it's one of those things where the, the, the system that sort of predicts how many cars you actually need has, has <laughs> completely failed them. Mm-hmm. And you just got this guy, like 25-year-old guy who's just like really looks frazzled. He doesn't know what to do. And so I stamp out of there. I'm annoyed with him. I'm annoyed that my plans are now in danger. And I stamp out, I get into the like Uber and I call what I think is the 800 number and I complain about the kid. And oh, it yeah. turns out it's the kid. 
Yeah. He's, he's like, sir, you I can see you through the window. I can see you. Oh, God. And then, I, if I remember right, I think ultimately he did have a car for me. So I had mm. to meekly stamp mm-hmm. back in and, like, get the car from. Like, it was the worst. I was complaining about this kid to him, thinking yeah. I was talking to the 800 number. It was bad. And do you remember, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Was he really frazzled? Because I will say, if I'm in a situation like that, and the person at least seems frazzled and apologetic, like that, that'll that go a long way for me. When Veeves and I had our nightmare situation of trying to not even just rent a car, but get the car that we had previously rented, and I believe prepaid for in Atlanta around the holidays. This is years and years ago. And Yelp just, review of a lifetime. That's literally when Genevieve stamped away. She's not as much of a stamper as I am, but she stamped away and literally yelled, you're getting the Yelp review of a lifetime, which is now a, a phrase that we have literally embroidered and hanging on our wall in our kitchenette in the basement. Um, anyway, like the, the thing that was most infuriating about that was that nobody seemed to care. Nobody seemed to care that it was the holidays and that we were 40 minutes from where we needed to be and that we had paid for a car and the car isn't there they're just like yeah that's that's how that's how it works if you have somebody who's at least like running around is just like i don't like pulling their hair out i'll at least give them credit for caring i he must not have been frazzled then because i'm the same way if, if the if the person is apologetic i think i'm usually like a little bit less rankled by the mm-hmm. whole thing but i was highly rankled mm-hmm. yeah i was like to the point where i was like I, I, who knows? He might have been frazzled and I was rankled. Yeah. He might have had a classic rankled frazzling. <laughs> Did that guy open for Leon Redbone yeah. one time? <laughs> he opened for Carrot Top. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do a little music for your weekend before we uh, get on out of here. Speaking of opening for Carrot Top, I don't need to open this. I don't need to open this conversation, but mm. there's a singer who I really like. His name is Tyler Childers. And, um, He's a sort of a country singer guy, but he sings really cool songs. I think he has pretty good politics. Like he's he's country, but not like a, you know, mm-hmm. whatever Brooks and Dunn or something. Peace and love to the Brooks and Dunn fans out there. I don't know why I picked their names, but something happened that I keep seeing on my TikTok. I think he was playing like maybe Madison Square Garden or something, and like Kermit came out. Kermit the Frog came out and sang with him, and it was like the full like you know. Oh, Jim Henson. That's what I'm seeing on social media. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And it like looks like a really cute thing, but what they what is killing me about it is that they did not think to construct some kind of little box for the guy who's being Kermit to be in. Oh. So the dude who's Kermit is just on stage hunched down, but oh, very I don't like visible. That. Oh, I don't like that. Right? And it's like he's and you can just see he's, he's some you know somebody's holding a mic he's singing into this mic as kermit and talking and he's working the like little sticks he's doing all the stuff that these you know sesame street or muppet you know uh, puppeteers or muppeteers do but you're seeing it all and it's like i this is madison square or some big venue mm-hmm. and you knew this was going to happen you could have figured out a way to make him the guy being kermit less visible yeah. to all of us get a like, box get a computer monitor box seriously. and paint some fake bricks on it <laughs> like make anything it but street this style. and i feel yeah. like nobody's talking about it and, and it's a it's an otherwise beautiful moment that has absolutely ruined Kermit the Frog for me. It's funny. I saw like somebody had posted as I was just like, you know, kind of quickly scrolling through Instagram stories. I saw somebody had posted a photo taken from the venue of the large jumbotron thing that was focusing on Kermit singing, but I couldn't figure out why we were looking at a, a picture of Kermit singing at a concert. So now I know that's one of the things I like about TBTL. I'll put that in my dazzling donor message. Mm-hmm. Um, you've been harping on me to become a dazzling donor. Um, You're the place that explains Instagram posts that you didn't fully look at. That I did, <laughs> that I just dismissed as being not for me. I'm with you though. I think people who are like really into puppetry, and there are a lot of those people, and probably a lot of them in our audience. Like, you know, I know the art of puppetry takes on various um, shapes, and I think there's a comfort level for a lot of people if you can see the puppeteers dressed in all black with turtlenecks or whatever they do. <laughs> and ski- you're just describing mummin shots <laughs> and ski masks. Wait. A 
second. And their puppets are bags of money with dollar signs on them. I don't know what I'm talking about their anymore. Their bones are their money. <laughs> but they pull I, your hair up, but not out. But I, but when you're talking about the world of the Muppets, which is a very like kind of specifically created and well established world, we don't want we don't want to see the people behind them. We just want to see the Muppets. We've already we have decided the, that the Muppets are as real as you and I are. Do you remember, Luke? And you probably need to get out of here, and so maybe I shouldn't bring this up. But I was listening to a podcast. I brought this up the other day. I've been listening to a lot of Scott Hasn't Seen, which is a Scott Ackerman podcast where um, he and his co-host talk about movies that he didn't see because he was like kind of more of a movie snob. And so he was watching like, I don't know, movies. He wasn't watching a lot of the things that you and I uh, call popcorn movies or things that were like more like kind of lowbrow or middlebrow in the 90s or whatever. And so um, he's revisiting them now as a 50 year old or whatever he is. Um, and one of those movies was, I believe, the first Muppet movie. Is that the Muppets Take Manhattan or the Great Muppet Caper? You are asking the wrong dude. I have like the Muppets are such a blind spot for mm, me. OK, that's interesting. So that kind of answers my question, because apparently they were saying that, like rewatching it now in 2024, there are moments that sort of seem kind of slow in the movie, but that the thing at the time, if you go back and you read the reviews, it's just kind of like we can see their legs like people were just so freaked out about the idea of like taking these Muppets that were always in a very controlled environment uh, on I the see. Muppet show or I guess Sesame Street. But these are the you know Muppet show Muppets um, and they're in this controlled environment and then just kind of putting them out in the wild and like kind of the technical aspects of that. But apparently there was a whole generation that was just shocked to see Kermit's legs, which it never occurred to Because I feel like on Sesame Street, we end up seeing Kermit's legs, right? When he's like doing a report from London in a trench coat or whatever. I, I think that, um, I don't think we see his legs, or I think we see him from the waist up. He's oh, buff- maybe that, yeah, maybe Buffeted that by the wind. Okay, that makes um, sense. But all right, what song would you like to, what Leon Redbone song would you like to suggest? When you drop, listeners? kick your jacket. I wanted to say, um, boy, there are times when I do music for your week and I'm like, I don't have anything. Like, I just haven't been listening to a lot of music. I don't know what it is about this time of year or if there's just a lot of good stuff coming out, but I've put together a playlist. I, I see, like, I've already got like 11 tracks in here. Some of them I've already played for you on Music for Your Weekend, and I've got like things queued up for the next several weeks. I listened to this entire playlist. I went for kind of a long walk yesterday and listened to this entire playlist. It is so good. Like every single one of these songs is so good, and I'm excited to play them for you. This one is by a band. I don't know anything about them. They go by the name Personal Trainer. Um, I don't know how this ended up on my radar. Be your own personal. Personal. Trainer. trainer, I was trying to follow your lead because of the thanks. The delay actually, there. You know what? You accounted for the delay really well. That was. It sounded like it was the same time to me. We do our best. Anyway, um, I think this came into my inbox via like press release. I think this is a brand new record called Round that is coming out, and this is the title track called Round. It's by a band called Personal Trainer. What I like about this, and I think you'll pick up on this too, Luke, is it doesn't sound like any other band we've ever heard before. I don't think when I pull this music down, you'll be able to make any comparisons to other bands we like. So if you were to draw a circle on a piece of paper (laughs) and write pavement in it and then draw another circle and write Dinosaur Jr. in it and line those two (laughs) circles up, you would get this song, Round by Personal Trainer. But I don't care. I love it. I love it to death. Oh, that's so good, dude. That's so, so catchy. I don't know that the full album is out yet. I want to look into that. Um, But yeah, I'm interested in hearing more of that entire record. That's all I've heard so far. Again, it's Personal Trainer. Um, I would like to suggest a song by Tierra Whack oh, nice. called Stand Up. 
You haven't played this song before on the show. Have I don't you? think I've ever played it. You know, Tierra Whack has a new record that either just came out or is about to come out, and I was digging a single off of it, but I don't think I've ever played it um, on the show. And it doesn't look like this is a new song that you're picking, right? I think it's from 2021. Okay. Um, and for whatever reason, this song has been popping up in my TikTok, like the video for this song, which oh, okay. I don't know if our friend Kat was associated with or not. I know that Kat has done videos for mm-hmm. Tierra Whack in the yeah. past. Yep. Um, but this song is just so durned catchy, Andrew. And I, I, I played a version on Spotify uh, today to refresh my memory, and it seemed like it was the quote unquote clean version. So I don't, but I don't know which one we're gonna play here. So just heads up, it may have a couple of racy words in it. But um, yeah, can you play a little Tierra Wax stand up? Yeah. 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 What a real please stand up and all the fake sit down. Hold your head, hold your crown. The world of real please stand up and all the fake sit down. Let me fix my crown. Mm. Big whack, cause I eat a lot. It's always begging, cause they need a lot. Card came with instructions, I don't read a lot. From the bottom, gotta feed the block. Mm. I don't need a chair, always come prepared. I am like the mayor, I am not the mayor. Gotta say a prayer before I leave the house. Coat hanging up my shoulder, gotta see the blouse. Mm. How me laying, don't I look scrumptious? Mm. He keeps staring at me like he want this. Mm. Million dollar, you cannot afford this. If I want it, I can make the Forbes list. Mm. How good is that? It's so good. Like Perfect. just like the production, mm-hmm. the writing, mm-hmm. the like. Uh, yeah, it's just like I can't get this song out of my head. It's so catchy. She's astounding. I don't know much of her catalog at all, honestly. Um, but I follow her on Instagram, and it's one of my favorite follows. She is an absolute, just like artistic and style icon. I don't know if you follow that stuff, Luke. But I mean, I don't follow her, her follow. on there, but I've never seen a photograph of her where she wasn't wearing something mind blowing. Just amazing, yeah. And it's just like I feel like it's just all coming together for her. I think she just released like that new record and and maybe some other projects related to that and I'm not exactly sure what they all are but I know that she's really having a moment and deservedly so it's so great I'm also trying to figure out I think is it possible her actual name is Tierra Wack? Oh, born with? I don't. I would have. No I, I mean, it. It look, we we just messed this up recently with <laughs> RuPaul. So. Oh yeah, right. When I, could, <laughs> I, I I just go to pull one stage name as an example, and I pull the one name that isn't a stage name. But I mean, a, from a very quick cursory look on Wikipedia, I think her name actually is Tierra Wack. Oh, that's Tierra, cool. Which is hilarious just because that word whack has taken on so much kind of yeah. other cultural context and naming yourself if you were to name yourself that um watch somebody's gonna email and be like no her name is tiara johnson and whack is mm-hmm. she just added that but if that's her real name it's like she was meant to be some kind of performer yeah. with the very tongue planted firmly in cheek yep kind of uh name for herself but anyway all right so uh, now we arrive at the listener suggestion, which is coming from, remind me again, the listener. Oh, so this was from Derek Schlicker. Um, and It's Schlichter. It's, sorry, Schlichter. And the name of the song is We're All Eating Each Other uh, by Juliet Ivy. It's we're all eating each other. Okay, see that was left out of the yeah. dazzling message. I think there and was a there was a there was a typo. I think it says we're all eating other in the in the message. Was we're all okay, eating sorry. each other. That makes sense. Yeah. I thought that was a weird name for the song. Yeah, you know, but... I I tried to fact check that on the fly and then I misread it. But yeah, according to YouTube, it's we're all eating each other by Juliet okay, Ivy. All right, that's how we're going to wrap up this broadcast week. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. We're going to be back here on Monday with more imaginary radio for you. So please do join us for that. In the meantime, have yourself a merry little weekend. Go Mariners, go Junior Sluggers, and please remember, no mountain too tall. And good luck to all.
You want to learn the first rule, you'd know if you ever spent a day in your life. You never open your mouth till you know what the shot is. Power out.